NCT COG is a voluntary association of local governments. It's one of 24 councils in Texas. And as part of NCT COG's water quality management planning work, we host a webinar on a topic related to climate resiliency or environmental justice every year. Um, this webinar is hosted by NCT COG and was prepared in cooperation with TCEQ and US EPA. Um, if you do have any ideas for future topics for these webinars, please feel free to send them my way and my email address is there on the screen. It is cbuckley at nctcog.org. Um, at this time, I'm now gonna go over a few housekeeping items. Um, first of all, please keep your microphone on mute until the Q&A session at the end. Um, the recording from this webinar is going to be posted on the NCTCOG website under the green webinars banner. Um, I will also be sending out follow-up emails regarding today's webinar to those who RSVP'd. If you did not RSVP and you would like to receive these follow-up emails, um, please email me at cbuckley at nctcog.org so I can get that sent to you. So today's webinar will last until 12 p.m. Central Time. We will hear presentations from four speakers and following all presentations, we will have a Q&A session if you do have a question during the presentations, please feel free to drop those in the chat um, to be answered during the Q&A. So I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, David Sloan. David Sloan is a senior treatment technologist and associate with Brees and Nichols in Austin. He has 40 years experience in the field of water and wastewater treatment and over 25 years experience in water reuse. David's experience includes evaluation, planning, and design of potable and non-potable reuse facilities, including CRMWD's raw water production facility in Big Spring. David is a board-certified environmental engineer and serves as the current president of Water Reuse Texas. And now, David, you may begin your presentation. All right, thanks. Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, water reuse from a, a municipal utility perspective. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that happens. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Uh, so I'll talk briefly about what water reuse is uh, from, from that perspective and talk about uh, some of the different types of reuse that can be done at municipal scale. Some of the other presenters will be talking about some some other types of reuse. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, case studies is probably too strong a word because we're gonna be flying through things uh, pretty quickly. So these are really just gonna be uh, some examples of, of uh, different types of reuse. Go ahead. So water reuse uh, may also be known as water recycling or water reclamation. Um, it's, uh, by EPA's definition, reclaims water from a variety of sources, then treats and reuses it for beneficial purposes. So all, all the types that I'm going to be talking about are, are going to originate in, in some way from a, a municipal uh, water resource recovery facility, uh, often referred to as a wastewater treatment plant. Um, so the Water Environment Federation proposed the term water resource recovery facility uh, quite a few years ago, just to emphasize uh, the, the useful product that is uh, typically produced from these facilities. Uh, even though it hadn't stuck, I think it's, I think it's a good uh, term for us to think about. Uh, let's go ahead. So some of the, some of the uses for reclaimed water, uh, many of them are, are non-potable. Uh, it can be used for industrial, particularly for cooling, uh, irrigation on a variety of levels, uh, construction, water, toilet flushing, uh, ornamental, you know, ponds and so forth. Uh, and then there's, there's several ways that water can be used to augment public water supplies. And we'll talk about some of those different configurations. Uh, when we look at non-potable reuse, some of the implementation considerations we think about 
um, is where where this uh, where this utility is going to reside. Is it going to be uh, on the drinking water side? Is it going to be on the wastewater side, or is it going to be uh, an entirely new entity to accomplish the reuse? Uh, with non-potable reuse, uh, the public acceptance, uh, especially in Texas, is is usually good. Uh, there's there's a long history of experience with it now. Uh, non-potable water pricing can be tricky. Uh, there's you know there's a balance to be struck between uh, low pricing to encourage people to use uh, re reclaimed water as an alternative. On the other hand, uh, if we price it too too low, then uh, really doesn't emphasize the value of that water, and people think it's uh, not not to be conserved, uh, which uh, shouldn't be the case. Uh, we have many places now that are actually uh, running out of reclaimed water in some cases, so we want to really think about the pricing. Uh, sometimes the payback may be slow, and when People consider uh, economic viability. Uh, sometimes they draw the circle too small on what the costs and benefits are. So I want to make sure we, we look at some of the offsets. Uh, you know, for instance, developing a new water supply uh, can be very expensive. And so if, if reclaimed water uh, postpones development of new supplies, uh, that can be a huge payback. Uh, and then Sometimes uh, for non-potable systems, uh, the large customers may be a, a key to making that system affordable. Okay. Um, so just quickly, uh, just want to make sure that that we're keeping the the reclaimed supply separate from either potable water or wastewater. Uh, we want to have proper labeling and. Uh, understand that the delivery is on a demand-only basis, which means uh, even if in the summer we're we're using everything we can produce of reclaimed water, uh, we still have to have that backup discharge or or uh, dedicated non-discharge uh, land application uh, available as a backup. And then leakage and runoff are considered to be uh, unauthorized discharges. Uh, so this uh, one of our first examples here. Uh, so at Las Colinas, uh, Dallas County Utility and Reclamation District has been operating a reclaimed system for uh, since the mid 1980s. Uh, it was really uh, one of the pioneers of, of non-potable reuse uh, for for uh, you know urban irrigation. Uh, they operate a, a chain of lakes there in Las Colinas that uh, that they they keep those lakes topped off with reclaimed water from the Trinity River Authority's Central Regional Wastewater System plant. Uh, and it that was put in place before we even had any any rules in Texas for uh, implementation of, of reclaimed water. Uh, but um, anyway, that's that's been a very successful uh, large scale use of reclaimed water. Uh, this map is just showing. Uh, this map is just, these numbers are all different customers. Uh, that they have in that uh, it, it's a very high end development, and uh, so those those ponds are are ornamental, but they also serve as as uh, points of of reuse. Okay, we can go ahead. Uh, City of Cleveland back in the uh, late 1990s uh, worked with uh, a new power developer to provide uh, a big portion of their available effluent to serve as cooling water uh, for the new power facility. Uh, so that started them on their reuse journey, which is uh, which we'll we'll see uh, will it has expanded over the years. 
a lot of cities now are operating uh, what we sometimes refer to as purple pipe systems. So uh, they'll have reclaimed water that's furnished to uh, multiple customers for irrigation, uh, golf courses, parks, uh, sometimes uh, commercial or industrial uses. Uh, so this is just an example, uh, city of Fort Worth. <clears throat> has a system from their Village Creek plant that goes uh, all the way up to the DFW airport. Uh, it has multiple customers along the way. But uh, this is practiced by Frisco and, and many others in the North Texas area. Um, I want to talk a little bit about potable reuse. Um, a lot of people have have been interested in it or scared of it or somewhere in between. Um, this uh, it's a way to directly augment our our municipal supplies using some form of of reclaimed water addition. Uh, it can provide a drought resilient supply. Uh, we we can use the water year round typically. And we're not so dependent on on uh, these anchor customers, uh, uh, large customers, to drive a system. And as uh, as cities grow, then then that supply of of reclaimed water increases. Uh, so when we talk, think about potable water versus non-potable water. Um, so non-potable reuse is, is typically going to be very seasonal because it's driven by uh, typically by irrigation demands. Um, it's uh, of course demand driven, and it requires a separate transmission system, so separate system of pipes. And generally, it's it's setting up a new system with with its own specific customers. Uh, it's really gained widespread acceptance. And so it's it's been a great uh, source of water conservation. Uh, potable reuse is, on the other hand, non-seasonal. Uh, we typically go year-round. Um, it's it's relatively independent of demand because we're we're usually storing that water in some in some fashion uh, seasonally. Um, it relies a lot on existing systems. Uh, it does require specific treatment to make sure that we're we're keeping uh, the supply safe. Uh, there tends to be a lot of skepticism in the public, especially if they're not uh, well educated about the process. And there are some inherent higher risks with a potable system. Oh, let's see. Uh, let's we we can go ahead and and uh, click all these buttons. But uh, some different scenarios here. So the the first scenario is just the fact that you know as as treated effluent gets discharged, uh, it almost always goes to someone else's water supply. So that's what we call unplanned or de facto reuse. Uh, it happens in the Trinity. It happens in the Rio Grande. It happens, you know, really all over the state. Uh, surface aug water augmentation is when we intentionally direct reclaimed water into a, a surface water supply. Uh, some some local examples are Lake Pat Cleburne, uh, which is uh, getting ready to start up uh, this fall. Uh, Lake Weatherford is already in operation, Lake Arrowhead up near Wichita Falls is already in operation. Uh, then a, a, a variation of that is river scalping with wetlands polishing. There's two really large systems in North Texas that do this. They're actually uh, taking water out of the main stem of the Trinity, and which in, in the summer is uh, Really highly uh, highly dependent on on effluent flows 
for the for the flow in the summer. And they're extracting that water from the main stem of the river, sending it through wetlands, which polish it, particularly for for uh, suspended solids, uh, keep those out of the the reservoir then that that the wetlands effluent discharges into. Uh, particularly uh, Richland Chambers Reservoir and Lake Levon. So that's done by the Tarrant Regional Water District and North Texas Municipal Water District. Uh, groundwater replenishment is not uh, not very common in Texas, but El Paso has actually been doing that with reclaimed water since the 1980s. Uh, then direct raw water blending. Uh, so that would be taking effluent, treating it to drinking water quality, and then blending that with other raw water supplies uh, prior to final drinking water treatment. So that's been done now uh, by CRMWD, the Colorado River Municipal Water District in Big Spring for uh, now 11 years. And Wichita Falls did it uh, for one year as an emergency project uh, using some facilities they already had available uh, back in the in the heart of the drought back in 2014 to 2015. And then uh, direct finished water blending is kind of the, the ultimate uh, potable reuse that that's taking that reclaimed water and treating it to a point where it can be directly uh, put into the, the drinking water distribution system. El Paso has a project uh, in progress to make that happen, uh, and that'll be happening uh, in the next couple of years. So uh, again, re reservoir augmentation. Um, this example is Lake Weatherford, uh, but again, that's uh, also happening other places like uh, Lake Arrowhead and, and will soon be happening in, in Cleburne. Um, the, the reclaimed water can, can increase the yield and keep the lake full even, uh, even if we're not uh, getting a lot of rainfall. Uh, it's, it's really important to model the, the water quality conditions, uh, make sure that, that uh, we're not uh, we're not degrading the quality of the water in the lake. Uh, key concerns are uh, nutrients, phosphorus, and nitrate, uh, protozoans. Make sure that, uh, again, we're, we're keeping this water safe uh, year round. Uh, salinity can be a concern. Uh, so it's got to be balanced with the, with the uh, normal inflows uh, and then suspended solids. Okay, let's. Uh, so this is a picture from uh, Tarrant Regional Water District's wetlands operation, where uh, this the water after the wetlands goes into uh, Richland Chambers Reservoir. Uh, North Texas does something very similar, uh, pulling water from the Trinity, sending it through the wetlands, and it goes to Lake Levon. Uh, so again, this this water uh, is a major contribution to the to those reservoirs and uh, really large volumes of reclaimed water uh, are occurring. Uh, so uh, in Wichita Falls, uh, I'll, I'll keep this very short, but uh, they had an existing uh, brackish surface water treatment facility to desalinate that water. Uh, the water got so salty during the drought that they could no longer uh, treat that water with it, but they were able to get a temporary permit to uh, take a big portion of their, their reclaimed water and run that through the desalination facility and then blend that with uh, their uh, raw water and go through their normal treatment process then. And they operated that uh, right at one year from July to July uh, 2014 to 2015. 
uh, and and they operated that until the until the drought ended. Um, in CRMWD's case, uh, that was always intended to be a permanent facility, and uh, again, there they uh, take effluent from the city of Big Spring, and they run it through uh, three additional treatment processes uh, to produce 1.8 mgd of purified water that's uh, drinking water quality. And then that's that's blended with other surface water supplies and, and treated by their various uh, member and customer cities. Yeah. So this is just a a show a, a look inside their building, but uh, the the three processes are microfiltration, uh, reverse osmosis, and then uh, ultraviolet disinfection and oxidation. So uh, as far as obstacles and approaches, uh, public perception is very important. Uh, we want to always be clear in the messaging that you know we are providing a, a, a safe water supply and it's it's not uh, something we're settling for. it's it's something that uh, typically exceeds uh, the quality of, of other water supplies. Uh, project financing is, of course, is is crucial for anything. Uh, there is a lengthy regulatory process, so that needs to be understood up front. Um, emerging contaminants are always, uh, you know, a, a question mark. Uh, back in the day, we were worried about uh, about uh, estrogen type compounds and uh, whether those were going to have health impacts. Uh, more recently, we've gotten very concerned about uh, PFAS compounds, um, and we're going to be looking at that uh, in all our water supplies. Uh, but it, it's especially a consideration in, in uh, potable reuse. So um, let's go to the next one, please. So planning is extremely important. Uh, we need to understand that that typically reuse systems are not, you know, they're they're not good solutions for the current drought, whatever that current drought is. Um, it's it's too late to implement a a big reuse project. Uh, what we can do is we can do reuse to help mitigate the next drought or the one after. Uh, by by really uh, making our water supplies more resilient and and using reclaimed water as a resource. Uh, so uh, it all takes time to plan. Uh, public education I, I, it was the last one I added, and I realized we always put it to the end, and it shouldn't be. Uh, public education is crucial throughout the planning process, and it needs to start at the beginning, not not as an afterthought. Uh, we have to evaluate what all the different pieces are that have to happen. Uh, we've got to test water quality. Uh, we may have to do pilot testing uh, for some some types of systems. Uh, there's going to be a regulatory review process. Sometimes that can be very lengthy. Uh, and then, of course, design and construction. So start early. Uh, finally, we, you know this is. Uh, this is not a new thing. Uh, reuse has been happening for for a very long time now. We've got uh, reliable technology. Uh, it's it's quite mature. Uh, we we use multiple barriers to make sure that you know if if anything would would slip through one, we've we've got another barrier that's going to uh, keep us safe. And you know the public. Uh, you know, we used to think that the public was never going to go for for potable reuse, but uh, with proper education, uh, we find that people come around, and if they get the right information, uh, they they will get on board in you know in large numbers. 
And uh, you know, this is this is water we just can't afford to throw away. And I think that's it uh, until we take uh, Q and A. Thank you, David, for that presentation. Um, as a reminder, we're going to be doing the Q&A after all the presentations are finished. But if you do have a pressing question, you can go ahead and drop it in the chat um, right now, and we will get to that during the Q&A session. Um, so I'd now like to introduce um, the speakers for our next presentation, Jennifer Walker and Usman Mahmoud. Um, Jennifer Walker is the director of the Texas Coast and Water Program at the National Wildlife Federation. She is a water resources expert with 20 years of experience helping city, utility, and state agencies achieve ambitious water supply management and conservation goals. Um, Jennifer is the chair of Austin's Water Forward Task Force and in 2021 was appointed by the Texas Water Development Board to represent environmental interests on the Texas Water Conservation Advisory Council. And she has a BS in Ecology, Evolution and Conservation Biology from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, Usman Mahmoud joined Bayou City Waterkeeper as a policy analyst in August 2023. Previously, Usman has worked with the Cent the Coastal Prairie Conservancy researching and advocating for healthy watersheds, his experience in policy as a legislative intern at the Texas State Senate, and as a junior summer institute fellow at UC Berkeley's Goldman School of Public Policy, cultivated a passion for reforming broken systems through improved policy and implementation. Raised in Houston, Usman is a licensed community health worker and is pursuing a Master of Public Administration at the UH Hobby School of Public Affairs. Jennifer and Usman, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful present, uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Usman Mahmoud, and I'm here with uh, my wonderful co-presenter, Jennifer Walker. Um, we are going to be presenting a tale of two cities. Uh, please, no copyright on that. Um, talking about Austin's water forward plan and the city of Houston's one water community cohort. Um, and uh, next slide, please. A uh, little bit about us. Um, and I'll just quickly say that Biocity Waterkeeper is a regional nonprofit based in Houston uh, that mainly works uh, to protect and advocate for clean water and uh, affordable drinking water. Um, we use law, science, uh, uh, policy, and, and uh, organizing action to further justice and, and uh, health safety of our regions and our waterways. And Jennifer, please feel free to speak. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're so proud to work in partnership with Bayou City Waterkeeper on this and other um, other projects. Uh, National Wildlife Federation's Texas Coast and Water Program works to ensure that um, Texas is managing and using water resources for the benefit of both people and wildlife. Um, we're we are very very focused on water policy um, planning. We also use law community organizing and all the tools that nonprofits have in their toolbox to use. But really, um, we try to work really closely in partnership with utilities, community decision makers, and our other partners in the NGO community. Awesome. Next slide, uh, and Usman's going to take it from here for a minute. Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, just a compare and contrast of the two major cities, um, you know, outside of North Central Texas. Uh, so, you know, challenges um, are, you know, quite similar in terms of population growth. Uh, Houston has for a long time been the fourth largest city, but Austin has has a very rapid population growth as well. Uh, so that means both of us are also facing uh, simultaneous water supply challenges, making sure that, uh, you know, the projections uh, that we see for decades beyond uh, are matching what are what the waters are uh, in our reservoirs. Um, and of course, climate impacts. Um, Houston uh, just two months ago went through a derecho storm, incredibly rare, uh, but practically a tornado that happened overnight. And then, of course, we went through Hurricane Bar Barrel just last week. Um, and so, you know, those sort of issues call for solutions. Uh, Austin has worked on a water forward plan, which is a hundred year water plan. Um, and, you know, they're currently uh, in the implementation process. Uh, and there's going to be updates while it's under development uh, for the city of Houston side. Uh, we are you know, the city's involved in developing the one water plan and, uh, you know, non uh, 
groups like uh, National Wildlife Federation and Vice City Waterkeeper are making sure that communities can be part of that process through the focus on the stakeholder input. Uh, next slide, please. So we want to um, make sure and, and um, ground everybody in one water and what one water is, because that is really the focus that Houston and Austin have taken. Um, you know, one water has is is a somewhat newish term for a concept that's been around for a long time, integrated water resource planning. Uh, but but one water is a is a comprehensive and interconnected approach to water management with a focus on making every drop of water in our community count and achieving multiple community benefits. Um, it focuses on designing and building water systems with local water supplies and water stressors in mind and considers drinking water, wastewater, stormwater all together as a system. Um, frequently these can be considered individually in, in communities and communities and they can all really be managed together. Um, a community's one water plan should be informed and led by community members that will implement and live with the plan and the strategy should be designed with equity and affordability in mind, be reflective of community values and anticipate climate change impacts. Um, the result really should be um, a long range locally derived water plan that yields multiple benefits, um, utilizes innovative, reliable and adaptive strategies to meet community water needs. Um, so, you know, one water really in my mind aims to ensure that water is here both for people and the environment um, today and for generations to come. And, and we really I think we really need, need to be leaning into this kind of planning because water supplies are constrained, our systems are stressed, and so we need to be thinking holistically about how we can solve multiple problems um, with with one with one planning effort. Next slide, please. And so some of the key principles of one water. Um, you know, as as a community embarks on a on a one water planning process or is implementing a plan is really, you know, managing this urban water cycle as an, in a single integrated system. You know, I mentioned um, the stormwater, wastewater and drinking water systems, you know, looking at, at how they can be managed in managed in an integrated way, maximizing water conservation, efficiency and reuse um, using as little as we can on a per capita basis to make our water supplies go further, using green infrastructure and nature-based solutions, incorporating community values into um, decision-making. Again, the community is the one that has to live with and be part of implementing this plan in the end. Um, collaboration across city departments that are, maybe aren't used to collaborating. They're like, this is the thing we do and we do it well. and you know, maybe I run parks or energy and I'm not, you know, these people over here run water. These folks, we need to all start working together. And then intentional investment um, and really thinking about achieving multiple community benefits. And, and then also being really transparent and looking at scientific data, future climate projections, being real about our water supply and the impacts that we're thinking that we might see in the future. Um, with the goal of enhancing climate and community resilience. I mean, in Houston is certainly an area that it just keeps, um, you know, we've had a couple events within a couple of months. So community resilience is top of mind uh, uh, for Houston. Um, next slide and pass it to Usman. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Um, yes, yeah, so pretty much all the things uh, that Jennifer just stated, you know, community resilience is a very important factor for the city of Houston, especially around water resilience. Um, so one water is basically has has potential to explore so many other equitable uh, frameworks for the city, especially when you know it's at a sort of almost like a climate crisis, uh, where you know one storm happens and another one comes, and then you find the same uh, underinvested uh, neighborhoods facing very disproportionate impacts. <clears throat> So uh, planning something like one water can can introduce, you know, more holistic and equitable infrastructure investments, um, you know, prioritizing uh, where investments haven't been consistently made. Uh, you know, it opens up opportunities to expand green infrastructure and nature based solutions, um, you know, whether that's through 
code or restrictions, uh, but you know, just opening up those doors, um, prioritizing resources for underserved communities, um, overall enhancing the climate resilience um, across the three systems, drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater. Um, and of course, there's larger goals as well, uh, including water quality improvement, um, as well as saving costs by making it efficient um, and optimizing water use across, uh, you know, public, private, industrial sectors. Uh, next slide, please. So there are some key players uh, that are part of the One Water Plan in Houston. Uh, of course, the city of Houston is involved, um, and it has gone through, you know, some challenges um, when they announced the One Water Plan uh, in the fall of 2023. Um, just a few months later, we had a new mayor and a new administration. And so, you know, there was a lot of navigating uh, new staff, um, new priorities from the uh, administration. Um, but the other key players, of course, J uh, Jacobs Engineering, who are the contracted consultants on the project. And um, they are working with the city. Uh, and of course, the stakeholders that both we view, we view and these other key players see are community, industry, and utilities. Um, so currently, the One Water Plan in Houston is in phase one, which is the, really the stakeholder outreach and engagement part. Um, what, we, uh, what we've been doing, uh, you know, National Wildlife Federation and Bay City Waterkeeper, uh, is we're keeping, um, you know, close dialogue with the city of Houston staff working on One Water, to a, as well as uh, Jacobs, to just uh, help understand where they are in terms of developing their guiding principles and their community vision, as well as a equity roadmap um, that are all sort of deliverables that have been, uh, you know, that are supposed to be part of this process. Um, you can see it says complete by July 2024. Um, that is what we were told, but um, of course, there's been setbacks and delays, part, uh, particularly by the new administration. And so uh, we're still hopeful that it could come this month, but well, you know, we, we are in close dialogue and we'll uh, get any updates that we need uh, before they move on to phase two, which is the two-year process where they begin, uh, you know, figuring out the development of an integrated system uh, with those three systems. Uh, and of course, this all should include uh, very digestible, incorporated community input that they should be getting uh, from phase one. Uh, next slide, please. So the Houston Water Department, um, how we're engaging is, uh, you know, we have experts like Jennifer on our team, as well as uh, what we've done with our cohort. Uh, we're able to share the expertise from One Water processes in other communities and cities that have developed these plans. We're able to share that, uh, and they have been uh, you know, open to uh, receiving those uh, resources and examples as well. Um, you know, leveraging you know, what we've seen in other states and uh, across the nation as well. Um, really, we're trying to create that support for really robust stakeholder efforts. Um, you know, how can we be the liaison or the, the bridge to community members um, that Houston Water can reach and ensure that their value, their input is uh, valued. Um, you know that that's where our efforts with just in, our engagement with city and state leadership is coming from. Um, and yeah, and the overarching goal is to just get those resilient water supplies and achieve those uh, community benefits. Uh, and next slide, please. So uh, the. Our two organizations, uh, what we've done is we are trying to build water champions. So we have established a one water community cohort in the city of Houston. Uh, it is an amalgamation of folks that are focused on conservation, uh, you know, land, wildlife. Um, and then there's folks who are on the environmental justice side, uh, you know, activists who are fighting for community and climate resilience. So we are trying to actually build a larger community grounded expertise on One Water uh, so that we can, you know, help ensure that we are very active participants uh, in the One Water planning process that the city is doing. Um, uh, yeah, and, you know, I just named some folks that are community members, conservation, water justice. Uh, our main goal is to leverage the community buy-in 
with this dialogue that we're having? How can we ensure that, uh, you know, the community members are actually, um, you know, equitably being engaged enough to ensure that they, they, they understand what one water is and why they should be, uh, sort of buying into that. Um, and we, you know, it's a space for co-learning. It's a space for education. So we are, you know, we bring out experts, uh, and people who have experience with one water planning, uh, and they share their, um, uh, you know, models and, ex uh, and experiences with community members. Um, and we have active communications about, you know, what our priorities are, uh, that includes various values, uh, you know, concerns about privatization, uh, as well as just overall community buy-in. Uh, and if you can move to the next slide. And so you can just see uh, some of the fr frames we have for our cohort. Uh, we have monthly check-ins, uh, virtual of course, but you know, uh, these are a, a good measure of us bringing us, bringing them any information we got from our dialogue with the Houston Water Department, any development in strategy, uh, any new learn learnings that we've had um, that we can really meet with a cohort and, and strategize on. Uh, there's also shared learning where we bring out, you know, educational experts uh, and, you know, maintain that dialogue as well of what we, how we can keep enhancing our planning. Um, and of course, communications, you know, we, we want to make an active effort to make this education as educational as possible. So, uh, you know, we were developing materials uh, and we're trying to facilitate feedback from our cohort members back to the water department uh, as much as possible. So we can really, so we're really trying to lead, you know, uh, influence the uh, stakeholder process uh, it, just to ensure that the city can keep it. Uh, and next slide, please. And some outcomes that, uh, you know, we, we'd like out of this cohort and just overall one water uh, in the city is we ha we'd like to have a strategic vision and a guiding principle for our one water plan uh, that comes from very intentional community engagement. Um, this is something that the city of Houston may sometimes lack in. So that is, that is why it's a number one sort of uh, uh, outcome that we'd like. Um, of course, um, the whole purpose is to build a resilient, adaptable, sustainable water supply uh, you know, ensuring, you know, whether that can mitigate flood impacts, um, if, if it can incorporate green infrastructure, um, and just overall protect our bay uh, bayous and waterways. And, you know, if we can succeed in the having a water, one water plan that, that is intentional in its community engagement, then, you know, we can serve as a blueprint. And of course, it could be a very transformational uh, achievement for the city. Um, and I love to now transition to Jennifer, uh, if she'd like to share experiences from Austin and her involvement with our uh, cohort in Houston. Yeah, thanks Usman. Um, yeah, the work in, in Houston is really important. Um, it's it's a, a city that um, is the fourth biggest city in the US. Um, it's incredibly diverse, it's huge. They've got a lot of um, climate driven issues to deal with there. So it really is like if we can do a really good one water plan in Houston that is really informed by the community um, that will be a huge, huge success. So um, we're really hopeful there and have really good working relationships with all the players involved. Um, a lot of that is really informed by um, our experience in Austin. So Austin was one of the the first communities in Texas to really look at one water as a water supply, um, as a as a theory kind of of change for our water supply. Um, you know, we we are have been growing like crazy. This picture just blows my mind every time I see this like comparison um, from across uh, from down um, on Lady Bird Lake and looking at just how the, how much the city core has changed, and that's reflected all throughout the city. Um, one of we can go to the next slide too. Um, so, you know, one of one of the things to note is um, we do have a, a one water plan or integrated water resources plan. It's it's our hundred year uh, plan looking hundred years out to the future. It was 
adopted by city council in November of 2018 and identifies diverse water management strategies to adapt to our growth, um, frequent drought and climate change that is is already apparent and, and will continue to kind of um, impact our region. Our goal is to ensure a sustainable, resilient, equitable and affordable water future for our community. Um, um, as as Kareen mentioned, I serve as the chair of the Water Forward Task Force in Austin. Um, Austin's my home. Um, Charlene, who you're going to hear from next, is actually the past chair. So those of us water folks that live in Austin have been really involved in this process. Um, but a little bit about how we got here. You know, Austin was in a really deep drought, um, the 2011 through 2015 drought and Austin was really looking at alternative water supplies, emergency water supplies and 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 city council said, hey, let's take a, a minute to think about what our emergency water supply should look like and what our water future looks like. And one of the recommendations from this group that Charlene and I both served on was that Austin needed to develop an integrated water resources plan, uh, a water plan. And so um, the good news is, is it rained and our lakes refilled and our water emergency was abated temporarily um, until the next drought. But during that time, um, a group of citizens, Austin Water, City Council, a bunch of folks developed Austin's first really integrated water supply plan um, that was adopted, you know, a, several years later in 2018. And we are firmly in the implementation phase now. Next slide. Um, so, uh, the, the plan really, um, continues to focus on water conservation, water use efficiency as one of our core supplies and, and kind of community, um, uh, priorities. Uh, the city of Austin has water supplies on the Colorado river and a contract with LCRA, but that basically was our sole source of supply, um, until this plan came along and we're working on implementation. Um, we're really trying to strengthen the long-term sustainability, reliability, and diversity of our water supply through maximizing locally available supplies. And one of our guiding principles really is that we are going to try to rely on locally available water supplies. Um, and we want to avoid severe shortages during times of drought. Um, is one of our goals as every community and we want to focus on projects that are technically socially and economically feasible and then another goal of this plan really is to continue to protect Austin's natural environment um, including source water protection and receiving water quality um, we share this water with our downstream neighbors uh, the water flows down through five counties down to Matagorda Bay um, so so we are not the only users of this water and then of course we wanted to engage the public and stakeholders throughout the plan development process so these really are the kind of core tenants of this plan um, since this is a reuse focused um, webinar, I wanted to talk a little bit about the reuse components of the water forward plan. If we can go to the next slide, um, we are developing a new uh, water forward plan or an updated plan that is going to be um, completed at the end of this year. Um, the task force is still very involved in that and we are meeting about it a lot. We had a, a meeting yesterday, in fact. Um, so thinking about reuse and Austin's water for plan and how how it shows up there um, and you know our our goal of relying on locally available water supplies um, which means leaning into reusing water at all levels and also means that we are going to try not to import water from other areas of the state we don't want to remove water from other communities and impact their future sustainability or resilience um, so we are growing our non potable water supply to meet non potable water needs um, which will which will reduce pressure on our potable water systems um, we have lot scale stormwater harvesting rainwater harvesting gray water reuse building scale reuse centralized and decentralized systems so we've got a lot. You probably can't read this table with all these numbers and, and letters, but uh, we do have, um, there is a, a summary of the water forward plan available online. I'll find the link while Charlene, Charlene is presenting and put it in the chat. And then this little table here with the pie charts just shows 
this purple piece is is the growing proportion of non-potable water that it makes up our water supply. Of course, we're going to need more potable water in the future, but we can't meet all of our water supply with portable water. Um, next slide. Um, this is, um, depending on how you like to intake information, a different kind of view of those pie charts, but it overlays our population. Um, in 100 years, they're projecting, I don't know how this is possible, but the population of Austin, and this is not the whole, you know, this is the service area for Austin water um, that we're going to grow to 4 million people from just over a million now. Um, we are projecting that our per capita water use will continue to go down, which is great and will be very much needed. But looking at this chart, you can see the top bar is our current water conservation measures. Um, we do quite a bit of water conservation in Austin, and we're actually looking at ways to increase that. The next bar down, um, um, looking from top to bottom, is additional water conservation and demand management measures. So that will continue to be a really core part of our water supply. The little gray bar, the third bar down, is on is on site reuse. Um, which is the growing piece. And I'm gonna talk more about that in the next few slides, but on-site reuse, we just passed a really important ordinance here and this will now start to grow in our community and become a very important piece of our water resilience. And then the purple bar, which you see gets bigger is our centralized reuse system, um, which also continues to grow. And we will continue to invest in building it out. Um, and then the blue, of course, is our potable water supplies. Um, uh, from the Colorado River, um, we have ASR projects in the works and other things. So let's talk a little bit about our new water ordinance. Next slide, our on-site water reuse ordinance. And I apologize, I should have put these next two slides in opposite order, but you'll get the whole picture with this slide in the next one. Um, so how are we gonna grow reuse in Austin? Um, like I said, we just passed an ordinance, it's been, um, it's been in a voluntary phase for a couple of years, but as of April 1st, we have a new a new ordinance in town. I'll describe it in the next slide. But um, one of the things that we are thinking about is, is um, how are we going to encourage people to do this? So we've got um, affordability incentives. Um, Austin Water is gonna provide incentives and grants for reuse and conservation, including monthly reduced, uh, reduced monthly fixed charges expediting uh, building permit review process because these on-site water reuse ordinances apply to commercial properties. Um, uh, there's going to be a low interest loan program that Austin Water is going to implement. And, they'll, and then there's also going to be a cost sharing program, like a cost sharing for extending our centralized reuse system to developments that want to take part in it. And of course, there's the PACE loan program uh, that that um, that developers can access to help blunt the upfront cost of dual plumbing a building or hooking up to a reuse system or including um, storage for rainwater harvesting or AC condensate. And then there's also the savings that we're going to have. You know, Austin, every city has a contract for water and there's certain conditions. Um, the more <laughs> water that we locally generate, um, we'll save our community. Um, we're looking at, at about a $10 million annual cost savings to customers. And, and some of the ways that we're funding this is we have now in the last couple of months, we now have an extra 15 cents per thousand gallon charge on our water bills. It's a community benefit charge. And this is going to be used to fund reclaimed water system expansions and on-site reuse programs. So everybody in Austin, um, that uses water above a certain rate will be paying 15 cents per thousand gallons. Um, I think that it was like about two dollars per like a dollar fifty to two dollars per bill based on the average bill. Um, and we've got um, some other programs that Austin Water is still figuring out the fine print on, but like a voluntary rate program, kind of like we have for wind power in Austin, where you can sign up and pay a little bit higher in order to support resilient water supplies and then excess usage fees um, may be part of our future. So this is kind of all the background. Let me tell you what the actual ordinance is. Next slide. Um, so our on-site water reuse ordinance um, applies to large commercial properties. Um, these are properties that are 250,000 square feet and above. Um, 
and we have it kind of divided into two categories. The second um, row is uh, commercial without multifamily, and the third row is with multifamily because um, they're both under commercial. Um, they have all these properties are required to do water benchmarking, to do kind of like a water budget and accounting of how they think the, the amount of water needed for their building. And then also if they are within 500 feet for commercial properties or within 250 feet um, for for multifamily required to connect to the centralized reclaim line if it if it is present. Um, the new ordinance is going to require that commercial properties install an on-site water reuse system. They're going to need to capture AC condensate and rainwater and dual plumb their buildings in order um, to use non-potable water captured on site or from the, re the centralized reclaim system for toilet flushing, for landscape irrigation, for the non-potable uses within their building. Um, this is really important and, and is projected to become, you know, a considerable part of our water supply in the future. Um, multifamily properties, kind of the nature of how they're built, are also going to be required to install an on-site water reuse system as well. One of the things that we spent a lot of time kind of wrestling with in Austin was affordable housing. Um, housing and affordability is, is a big deal, and and um, we want to make sure that that's not impacted. So affordable housing um, is exempted from this, but the exemption means that Austin can actually cover the costs of this. So we don't want to exclude affordable housing from the benefits of having this resilient water supply attached to the actual development. But we also want to make sure that we're able to cover the cost for that and not increase the cost of those of those buildings and, and make um, have an affordable housing impact. Um, next slide. I want to go through an example of kind of how this works. Many folks may be familiar with the Austin Public Library. We had a great tour of it for folks that came to the Water Conservation Symposium earlier this year. Uh, but the Austin Central Library is 200,000 square feet. Um, it um, is connected to the Austin Centralized Reuse System, but it also generates water on site by collecting rainwater and AC condensate. Um, this water is collected and stored in a 700,000 gallon tank. Um, so huge, it's a huge tank and it's it's there, it's a remnant from from um, the electrical generation plant that used to be there. So it's real good to dual purpose that. But um, but that water is then transferred to 1200 gallon cistern where it's then used for um, landscape irrigation and for toilet flushing at, the, at our library. So this system provides 90% of the water that is needed to operate this building. Um, that's huge. Um, imagine this, um, stamped across the city um, for, our, you know, you saw the picture of the skyline, the before and after the skyline um, and the growth in Austin is abundant and never ending, it seems. So we need to make sure that all this new development is making water um, for itself um, and and reducing the pressure on our potable water system. So this on-site reuse, the, the growth of the centralized reuse system, um, are both our, our big goals of, of our community and, and we're relying on locally available water supplies, reusing water that we already have. Um, David was talking about some of that. Charlene's going to be talking about that too, but this is um, a living laboratory in Austin as we can, as we start implementing this phase of our water forward plan and really um, just putting our water resiliency in place and building it more strongly. Um, there's a couple of other examples around Austin, but um, I'm pretty sure I'm out of time at this point. And um, our contact information is here when you'll get the slides, but I will stop here and pass it on to the next person. Thank you, um, Jennifer and Usman, for those, that presentation. Um, I'm now going to introduce our final speaker, Charlene Lorick. Um, Charlene is 
Texas Water Trade's founding CEO and strategic advisor. She founded Texas Water Trade in 2018, bringing a decade of experience in sustainable water finance, long range water planning, and water transactions. She previously directed the Texas Environmental Flows Initiative and chaired the Austin Water Forward Task Force. She is a Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation entrepreneur and holds a BA in Physics and English from Washington University in St. Louis, and a Master's in City Planning from MIT, where she was a fellow in the MIT USGS Science Impact Collaborative. And she currently serves as interim CEO of Vita Water PVC, a wholly owned subsidiary of Texas Water Trade, which aims to provide clean and affordable drinking water for underserved populations in Texas. Um, Charlene, you may now begin your presentation. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I've been learning a lot. I hope you all have as well. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on the on-site water component uh, that Jennifer just talked about in the context of Austin, hopefully exploring how we can try to scale that across the state of Texas. Um, and I'll touch on a little bit how we think about on-site water reuse as something that interacts with and is um, uh, really complementary to centralized reclaimed water systems. It's not, uh, it doesn't have to be an either or. Um, like uh, you just heard, Texas Water Trade is a nonprofit that has been around for five years. Uh, we do work all over the state of Texas, working with many different types of water rights users from agricultural water rights users um, to industrial water users. Um, and increasingly we're focused on how we help grow our urban population centers um, and those that are kind of on the fringes of that growth um, in a way that increases our total water supplies as a state um, and grows supplies that are climate resilient. Um, and we've heard uh, from lots of different folks about why that's so important. Um, so I, I am going to leave this slide on here for just a second. If you want to use your cell phone, if you have it nearby, um, to grab a screenshot or a photo of that QR code on the left-hand side, um, that's going to provide you a jump link to our Net Zero Water Toolkit, which I'm going to be referencing in my slides. Um, and so you can dig into all the different things that I'm going to be talking about um, and even more, if you miss the opportunity to grab the QR code, you can find the toolkit on our website um, under publications. And I think there's even a link to it um, from our homepage. Um, I just want to say um, extra thanks to those um, organizations who helped us create this toolkit. Um, which includes the Lower Colorado River Authority. Uh, we buy firm water from LCRA as a nonprofit and work with them to deliver that water to the coastline in Matagorda. Uh, from Austin Water, who's been a collaborative partner with National Wildlife Federation, where Jennifer is. We've, we've all worked together on uh, uh, exploring how we finance on-site water. And then Aquacell, which is an Australian-based water treatment company um, that sells uh, and designs and even can operate um, on-site wastewater treatment plants from the package scale to um, the tallest building in downtown San Francisco. They designed, built, um, and operate that uh, wastewater system on-site, um, which treats all of the uh, wastewater that comes out of the tallest building in that city. So um, real interesting company um, and something to be thinking about as we're exploring kind of the ecosystem around on-site water. So um, we talk about on-site water sometimes in terms of net zero water, and I'll just take a second to explain why we do that and what that means. Um, so one, the reason that we talk about net zero water is um, we think that it's foundationally important to look at growth, population growth, and new development, um, and even ur urban infill development as something that can be a supply of water that can serve its own needs, and as we'll explore, even provide enough water sometimes to go beyond what that building demands, and actually not only fully net out its uh, water demand that it's putting onto the system, but there are a, there's a growing portfolio across the country of projects that are called net positive. In fact, if you're really interested in the concept of net positive water and water reuse, there's a whole conference on it related to industrial water use that's going to be happening uh, through the Water Reuse Association in Indian Wells, California in November. Really interesting growing field. Um, we tend to like to talk about net zero water uh, because it helps us take what can be a very 
political uh, kind of adversarial conversation. It depending upon where you are in the state, particularly in Central Texas, where water is kind of seen sometimes as a tool to prevent development from happening. Instead, we try to frame this up as a way that developers can be part of the solution of growing our total water supply across the state. Um, not every project, and in fact, many projects are not going to be truly net zero today in our current operating environment, not because they technically can't get there, but because all of the different things that shape whether you, how you tap into the water that's available within the built environment, there's not all of the kind of policy and regulatory enabling factors in place for us to build completely off-grid buildings from a potable water standpoint. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today is about the non-potable components of buildings demand and communities demands, um, which of course is the lion's share of the demand that they place on our water resources. Most of the water that we use does not need to be of potable quality. Um, so really net zero is about a design mindset and awareness, a different way of seeing the built environment um, that can help us unlock very deep water conservation. So um, we have to think about it as something that is more powerful than the type of water conservation we can achieve through low flow uh, fixtures and toilets. Of course, that's very powerful as well. And many of your communities have probably found more water available within your current supply through that kind of traditional form of water conservation. Um, but the buildings and the communities that we're going to be talking about with on-site water um, are able to go so much deeper than that in terms of total water conservation compared to a typical building. So these are presenting maybe as little as 10 to 30 percent of the type of demand on centralized supply as a typical building. There are really great synergies with the demand they place on constrained wastewater systems as well. And that might speak more to where your community is, uh, particularly if you have a lot of legacy wastewater infrastructure that's really constrained as you see more density coming into your communities. Uh, it helps to get more life uh, out, of, out of those facilities as well. But remember, it's a design goal. So it's not about if you can't build a building that fully nets out its demand, then there's no reason to look at it. It's about how we rethink what the built environment is and then make our way toward that new way of sourcing our water and our water treatment services. Um, we've heard a lot about this from Jennifer already. Um, I won't fully exhaust all the forms of water that are available to our built environment, but just imagine it's everything from what buildings are passively doing. So um, they're passively intercepting groundwater. If you're building a parking garage or any sort of sub basement, most likely there's a sump pump that's having to intercept that water. Um, and then it's discharging it into your wastewater system. You're paying that fee as the building operator for that. Um, you are generating just by happenstance air conditioning condensate by uh, controlling the climate within your building. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what a phenomenal supply of water that is, uh, but that you're just doing that by incident. You're not, or it, incidentally, you're not trying to create those forms of water. They're happening within the built environment. We often think of them as waste, but they can be quite substantial. Um, and then the we look beyond that to the other forms of water on site uh, that we actively try to capture and reuse. Rainwater, when it's hitting a roof surface where it's pretty clean, that same water, if it lands on a parking lot, is storm water. That has very interesting implications when we start thinking about reusing those forms of water. If you're concerned about non-point source pollution, and I know this is a water quality group, and so that might be something that unlocks opportunities within your community where you're dealing with non-point source uh, discharges. And sometimes that, that can limit your point source discharges if you're operating a wastewater utility. So very interesting to think about the nexus there. Um, and then beyond, even to capturing sink and toilet water for reuse. Um, the amount of water that you can generate from a building, of course, is going to be very site dependent. And so context is everything. We're really grateful to Dr. Robert Mace at the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment in San Marcos for working with some folks to develop what we think are the first uh, kind of gradient maps in Texas that can help you connect climate whether that's humidity or whether it's rainfall uh, for a building of the same size, the same roof uh, size that's intercepting that rainwater, the same storage size. In this case, they were modeling 30,000 gallons of storage for that 3,000 square feet of rooftop catchment. 
um, or the same tonnage. Um, so I, I wasn't super familiar with air conditioning tonnage, but basically for every four to 600 square feet of climate controlled space, you have about a ton of air conditioning capacity. And so if you're looking at a hundred thousand gallon, I'm sorry, a hundred thousand square foot building uh, in the Dallas area, you're generating uh, 500 gallons per year for every ton of air conditioning you have on hand. Um, and that's roughly 7,000 gallons a month that you're just kind of passively generating because you happen to be cooling the space. Uh, so context is everything, but these are large volumes of water. Um, and as we start to think about uh, on-site water planning, just like we would be thinking about a traditional water planning portfolio, we wanna create a nice diversified portfolio that we know is gonna create reliability throughout se uh, different seasons of demand and supply, um, and also be resilient, as resilient as possible to any sort of long-term climate changes that might be happening, or even kind of shorter term climate, severe climate events like uh, droughts. So air conditioning and rainwater catchment really interesting supplies to try to pair within a building environment. Uh, rainwater obviously is reliant on how much rain is gonna fall in any given year, but those months when we're not seeing a whole lot of rainfall, we're still producing a ton of air conditioning condensate. Similar water quality, similar treatment trains, they can be stored in the same cisterns, which you wouldn't necessarily wanna do with dirtier forms of water. Um, and so that's a real interesting insight that you can learn more about through that toolkit. Um, there's no, the tricky part of this, just like water supply planning is, there's no one answer to how do you actually tap into the water resources that are available to a community or a single building or a corporate campus or a school campus. Um, there's an array of options. And so there's some user um, expertise required to navigate the different options in front of you and think about it in terms of a regulatory complexity kind of cost uh, implications for building it and then operating it. That's super, super important and often not well thought through. Um, and so there's thankfully tools that have been created first by the EPA, Austin adapted it for Austin-based climate, uh, but those tools and resources uh, can be easily modified within your community to reflect its uh, regional meteorology and hydrology um, and help you think about what the right tools might be. So those are resources that are linked in our digital toolkit. You can find them there. Um, that is really one of the first steps at the early stages. That's why Austin Water has that rule requiring all uh, projects uh, that are that are on the larger side to come forward and do a site design water budget analysis is because that's a fundamental first step to understanding what your options might be. The next step, of course, is going to be, well, how do I decide between these different options uh, and types of water? Um, and one of the really important questions that we found was like pretty hard for a lot of people in the development community to understand is what are my permitting, what are the permitting hoops I'm going to have to jump through? Um, so this is some of what we brought forward um, within the toolkit was a little kind of flow chart to help you think about the form of water you're trying to intercept, its end use, is it outdoor drip irrigation, is it spray irrigation, are you bringing that water back inside for any reason, um, and then what sort of permitting regulatory um, hoops are you going to have to move through? Uh, the good news is, I think, is that in a lot of the state of Texas, unless you're dealing with black water, that toilet flushing water and kitchen and utility sink water that has a lot of pathogens in it, you're not having to deal with TCEQ rules. So you're really dealing with local uh, rules set by your city, your county, the utility that might be serving you. Um, that is good news and bad news because a lot of communities aren't yet at a point where they even know how to permit this stuff. And so um, that's an area where I think the nonprofit community uh, like Texas Water Trade and others like to play a role is helping communities that are in the early stage of thinking about this stuff um, understand where they might want to be looking at adapting their own permitting uh, processes so that they can make this easier if they think this might actually be part of the way that they want to deal with water quality, wastewater capacity issues, um, water supply uh, growth that's needed to support population growth. We also wanted to talk about the financing tools that can help developers and communities build this stuff without dealing with the inherent disincentive of, okay, now you're asking me to dual plumb a building. Now you're asking me to do 
water treatment on site. How am I going to layer that into all of the other needs that I have as a developer, as a builder, um, as an owner operator of a building? All of them have different holding periods, different incentives. And so we just wanted to do a kind of a landscape exploration of all the tools that have already been developed in the state of Texas that help us build our built environment including our traditional water infrastructure. And many of those tools are relevant to the types of stuff we're talking about here today, whether that's centralized reclaimed or it's on-site water reuse. And when we start looking at on-site water reuse and even connecting to purple pipe, there's some really interesting stuff that is used quite a bit in places like the DFW Metroplex. Uh, public improvement districts are one. They haven't really been built out at scale here in Central Texas. A lot of communities are still early in the stages of figuring out how you negotiate those agreements. But PIDs are done um, hand over fist in the DFW area. And so that's an area I'd encourage y'all to really dig into. And of course, uh, it's more than we can get into today. But if you're interested in talking about some of these financing tools, happy to have that conversation with you. Um, along with the ways that you might be able to provide incentives as a utility, or even last week we were talking to a groundwater district manager in the Houston area who has um, disincentive fees that are meant to disincentivize over pumping of groundwater. And so we were talking about those fees as potentially a way of creating that incentive for developers building out new subdivisions and master plan communities to think about on-site water as an alternative to just raw groundwater. So there's a lot of different um, opportunities. You heard from Jennifer some of the types of uh, buildings that already exist in the state. We only have 10 minutes left as a group. And so I'm not going to talk about all of these. I'm just going to say it's everything from mixed use, master planned, high density, where the developer was really incentivized by density bonuses that they got by reusing stormwater. So they weren't having to uh, put six acres into stormwater detention ponds. They were able to cut that um, uh, amount and turn that into high value real estate. Uh, that was what brought them to the table. Uh, you've got a local municipal utility district that has been actually putting all of their uh, treated wastewater into uh, direct non-potable reuse uh, and selling it directly to residential customers, selling it to commercial customers and institutional customers, cities so that they were able to actually start selling their land application permit fields, their TLAP fields, and putting that into their infrastructure uh, financing. So that was their incentive uh, for moving into this space. Uh, we're really interested in how we incentivize this for single family home communities. We think that's the next frontier. There's not a lot of good examples of this out there um, in the United States, uh, certainly not in Texas, but uh, with Aquacell, who designed, built, and uh, implemented an on-site wastewater treatment facility for outdoor reuse in Australia, we were able to get this case study uh, where the developer was able to increase uh, their profit by $11 million by adding more housing by doing reuse instead of traditional wastewater um, disposal. One last piece on this is you have to think early and often about maintenance, ongoing maintenance. If you don't, you will most likely end up seeing these facilities either mothballed, not used, or really underperforming dramatically. Um, and so that's an area also where we would like to provide more resources to communities who are looking at this. How do you make sure you've got the workforce and the maintenance plan in place uh, to be able to maintain these systems? So all the things that I just talked about, this is not easy and straightforward if you're just starting out. Um, we would love to provide support. We are so happy that last week we were able to bring on board our net zero water engineer. This is a professional engineer who can provide support from uh, initial site planning and design analysis, water budget, uh, and kind of permitting analysis to working directly with communities uh, to help them figure out how they might be able to shape some of their incentives um, to bring forward projects, not just in the public sphere, um, all of our municipal buildings and schools, but it also in the private sector, um, all of the new communities that are that are coming up in our community. So um, really thank you for your time today. Thanks to the COG for hosting us and I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Charlene. Um, we now have some time for questions. So you can either use the raise hand function and I will call on you to unmute your microphone and ask your question, or you can put your questions in the chat box and I will read them out loud. Um, 
Um, I do have a question. I'm just curious, kind of in each of your individual reuse projects, if there's been any um, kind of what unexpected challenges Brent, I you've think your mic might have gone out. Oh, no. Um, I can hear you fine, Corinne. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, yeah. Um, I was just going to say, like, what unexpected challenges you faced and how you might um, now that you face them, if there's kind of a different way that you would approach those that might be um, beneficial for other communities that are kind of interested in engaging with this work. Well, we we haven't at National Wildlife Federation actually implemented any projects, but I will say as far as getting policies in place that are going to support the growth of reuse in our community. Some of the unexpected challenges that we ran into was, well, actually it was expected <laughs> and Charlie you could probably add to this too, but, but the, um, the, the affordability question. So it's really important to um, have some solutions in place for that or some ideas and, 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 you know, for the water utility or the, local leadership to think of ways to cost share or incentivize and to make known like Texas Water Trade and National Wildlife Federation did a report looking at the PACE program and really dug into how it could be used for these types of strategies. Um, we have looked at affordable housing because we knew that that would be an issue and 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 making the case for inclusion of resilient water supply strategies and affordable housing. Um, so so I think just kind of anticipating some of the conversation around that and then also understanding that at the end of the day, this must maybe the best thing that the water utility can decide to do and they have a really great plan. But at the end of the day, you also have, in most cases, elected officials that are going to have to ratify your plan and support it. So you need to really be very mindful about about making sure that your elected leadership understands the benefits of the plan and what you're doing um, and, and are able to support it. Great. Okay, well, um, are there any other questions? Okay. Corrine, while, while you're waiting for other questions, I'll just kind of um, build on that a little bit, which is to say, again, that the, this question of ongoing maintenance and workforce really can't be overstated. Um, and I really am very appreciative of efforts within Austin Water, which is right now in the process of developing an um, on-site water operator certification course um, and test, which they're coordinating with other national entities to develop. We think there's broader national relevance because um, as I mentioned earlier, you don't have to have TCEQ permit. You don't have to have a TCEQ licensed operator to operate these systems unless you're dealing with black water. Um, and yet they take skill, they take expertise. Um, there is a public health dimension to it because water can grow stuff. So it's real important that you do it um, the right way, not only so the system keeps working, but also so that people can safely interact with that water. I um, mean, so that's another thing that I'd really recommend people to keep an eye on. Um, that certification course is going to come out in the spring. Um, and I think there's a really excellent workforce development narrative here as well. I mean, these these are needs that um, can be satisfied by people who aren't on a career pathway that's going to lead them through four-year accredited college um, institutions. It's great work for people who want uh, skills that our communities need. So stay tuned to that. Great. Um, that's really good to hear. I know there's like the building operator certification, so uh, that there's kind of a water aspect to that as well um, is quite exciting. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat and I don't see any raised hands. So um, as uh, we're kind of, oh, David, do you have something to well, add? I, I, was, I was just gonna chime in uh, as far as lessons learned goes, uh, you know, for those of us that are, are trained as engineers, uh, we we think we've, you know, got a good handle on things and, and we know what we need to look at and we're going to come up with solutions. And, you know, we really need to look at these examples of the, the one water approach where we're really reaching out to a wide variety of voices and, and perspectives uh, to see problems that uh, those of us that are 
you know, really technically focused may not uh, may not grasp on our own. So I, I really like the the ways these programs are are structured to to reach out to other voices. Yeah, collaboration is definitely um, I think very beneficial in this um, this topic. So. Um, so it looks like we're kind of nearing the end of our time. Um, so I'm gonna start wrapping up. Um, just as a reminder, for those who RSVP'd, you will receive a follow-up email. And if you didn't, and you would like to receive those materials um, to go ahead and send me an email, the email's on the screen there, um, as well as the recording's gonna be posted on the NCT Crowd website um, under the webinars banner. Um, I'm now gonna put a survey link in the chat. Um, if you could please fill that out and provide us with your honest feedback, um, that really helps us um, kind of improve our future webinars and make sure that we are um, presenting you with information that is actually um, valuable. So with that, um, I'll say thank you again to everyone who listened in today. Um, and again, thank you to our speakers, David, Jennifer, Usman, and Charlene um, for taking the time to share the information with us. Um, and so with that, the webinar is now over. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.